Before you say, my own church does not have dogma. Before you say, my own church is a Bible-believing church. My own church is holiness church. And you argue for your denomination that that our denomination does not have any dogma at all. Look at this. What is a dogma? Dogma is a religious doctrine that is proclaimed as true without scriptural proof. Any doctrine we hold in our church that does not have any proof in the Bible, that is a dogma. Jesus Christ is our perfect example. The Holy Spirit is our superior authority. And the Bible is the basis by which we do anything in the church of the living God. I'm excited to welcome you to Tunde Fumi YouTube channel. We ask that you please subscribe to our channel for inspirational songs, powerful messages, and content that will bless you. Please do subscribe and you will never remain the same again. God bless you. In Acts chapter 23, I'm going to read verse 7. And when he had so said, there arose a dissection, division, between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. There was an argument between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Why? Because they have different dogmas. The Pharisees have what they believe in, which the Sadducees disagree with. And the Sadducees have what they also believed in, which the Pharisees disagree with. Let's see it in verse 8. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees confess both. That means the Pharisees believe in the resurrection, believed in angels and spirit, but the Sadducees say no resurrection, no angels, no spirit. And then, why the Sadducees have differences with the Pharisees is because of dogmas. Today we are talking of this, danger of church dogmas. Or put it this way, dangers of denominational dogma. You know, when we have church denominations, we have what made them denominations in the first place is because of the various teachings that does not agree with the other place. And so, when this pastor disagree with the other pastor, he says, I can't continue in your church. He goes out from his own denomination. And then in his own denomination, somebody lies again and says, I disagree with it. He goes out, forms his own denomination. That's exactly why we have so many denominations and we have so much division also. Now, the danger of church dogma is such that people will rather believe in the man, believe in their leader, than believe in the authority of the scripture. Why would someone who is a religious leader, like the Sadducees, say there is no resurrection? When they have seen quite a lot of that, that should have dispelled that doubt in the Old Covenant. Why would someone, a Pharisee, have traditions of men and have their own ideology that is not written in the scripture? Because again, they have their dogma. Look at Matthew chapter 23. I'm going to read verse 1. Matthew 23, verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples saying the scribes and pharisees sit in moses seat what are they doing look at verse 4 for they bind every burdens and grievous to be born they have additional things they have taught the people their own tradition and lay on men's shoulder and they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers when you have a religious leader who have so many rules and don'ts do many do's and don'ts, but the people under his influence, under his authority, and it keeps them in that kind of bondage. That is why we have so many misbehavior. When eventually one of those people or some of those people leave that denomination, they begin to speak against that church. They begin to speak against that denomination because now they felt like they are out of the cage. And that is why churches and leaders of churches should desist from imposing dogmas on people. Before you say, my own church does not have dogma. 
Before you say, my own church is a Bible-believing church. My own church is holiness church. And you argue for your denomination that that our denomination does not have any dogma at all. Look at this. What is a dogma? Dogma is a religious doctrine that is proclaimed as true without scriptural proof. Any doctrine we hold in our church that does not have any proof in the Bible, that is a dogma. Though we pro proclaim it as if this is the truth, if it is not binded, written in the Bible, if it is not binded on the scripture, if it cannot be, if we have no scriptural proof to that that we hold on to tenaciously, as tenaciously, as religiously, as we hold on to it, is a still dogma. Number two, what is dogma? A dogma, a doctrine, is a doctrine, a code of belief. That is accepted as authoritative by a denomination. You may accept that thing in your church as if this is authoritative, as if this is the final thing, and yet we do not see it being taught clearly so in the Bible. We may make inferences to make those conclusions. We may make so because Paul did this, and so we make a doctrine out of it. That Paul did it doesn't make it a doctrine. In fact, it has to be practiced by two or more apostles. It has to be taught because the Bible said in the mouth, Jesus says so, in the mouth of two or more witnesses shall every word be established. So if apostle A with apostle B, apostle C, in the Bible, not by apostles of these days, in the Bible, written in the Bible, preaches this, and the other one preaches that, and the other one teaches this, that becomes a foundational doctrine we can hold on to. Now, but then to further explain what doctrine is, I mean dogmas are, that negate what may be written as the scriptural doctrine of the Bible. Write the word dogma vertically. We want to give us an acronym of the word dogma to spell out what is dogma. D. Doctrine beyond the Bible. Doctrine beyond the Bible. Any doctrine that any man of God preaches that is not from the Bible, it is going to be called dogma. Why? Because it's not written in the Bible. It may be a sound, that something that looks like a sound doctrine. It may look like a sweet doctrine. It may be like something lovely. But if that doctrine cannot be traced to the Bible, it's beyond the Bible. Or a teaching somewhere that is beyond the Bible, that doctrine beyond the Bible is dogma. Oh, oppression without the scripture. When we are so fixed on a particular oppression, this is what we do. This is how we must do it. And we don't release or allow the people to ever think or be led by the Holy Spirit. We must say, they must do it this way. This is how we do it here. We must read this prayer the way it's written on the paper. This is how we do it here. Oppression without the Spirit. We must carry this outline and you must read exactly as it is in the outline. You must not add anything to it. You must not subtract anything from the outline, outline given in the church. Now, that becomes an oppression without the Spirit. G. Given outside the new covenant. Given outside the new that means when you begin to emphasize a form of giving like in the church of today we see this almost all contribution in the church they will say make a vow you must force people and force people to make vow and that's not written anywhere in the bible vows are supposed to be voluntary they say no we want to have that special program you must make a vow write it on paper write it on paper we must we must write it on paper and submit so we can know what we're expecting you force people to make vows in the church that is unscriptural given outside of the new covenant that is not written anywhere in the new, new covenant people in the old, new covenant they give number one according to their ability Number two, they give according to their conviction, what they think, what they believe they can afford. Let them give that. Not that somebody say, you must pledge. You must pledge. Making people to vow that given outside of the new covenant. M in dogma, movement restricted by the prophet. When we have a leader in a church, who determines what the church must do, what the church must not. And somebody say, because he hears directly from God. And then he says, in this church, we don't have the gift of diverse kinds of tongues, neither do we demonstrate the gift of the interpretation of tongues, and so we don't comment on it. Because our prophet restricts our movement. Movement restricted by the prophet. Once the leadership of the church detects 
what must be, what must not be in the church. And when you have when you have a special gift or you have a particular gift, you are careful. This leader must not see me demonstrate this. You are careful. This leader must not see me say this. That is movement restricted by the prophet. That's dogma. A authority taken as infallible. Authority taken as infallible. And you have people who say, you know, in my church, my pastor is never wrong. All his actions, all his words, all his movements, they are all invaluable. He never makes a mistake. If you say that to about a man of God, what you are preaching is actually dogma. Because there is nothing in the scripture that says a man has become a God. And only God is infallible. Only God has no need to make any changes. Only God makes no mistake. But every man, including the best of men of God is still a man, and so they are not infallible. When you take the authority of a man as infallible, you somebody said, If that thing was wrong, our pastor will have corrected it. So, because he has not corrected it, so he's right. And if they he correct it, then it becomes wrong. That is dogmas in that church. Once a person says you must not question leadership, even when you don't see when you seem to believe that ah, this thing they are doing is not in the scripture, this thing they are doing does not. I mean, rhyme with the Bible. You say, no, you must not question leadership. That is dogma in the church. When somebody says uniformity, we must do it the same way. And that uniformity has been equated to unity. That is basically dogma in the church. When somebody says, oh, all that you need to know of God, you will know it here. Everything you need to do for God, you must do it here. Your service to God must be in our church here. Once you begin to say that and we do that and we enforce that, that is dogma, that is no longer the scripture. And that is why we say any authority that is taken as infallible in the church is just an entrenchment of dogma in the church. As to spell out this and conclude this, structures above the welfare of the chief. You see, when we have a structure that we have set up, that even if somebody is dying, that money that you could have used to help and rescue and keep a person alive, you still must pack the money and give it to the church. The structure, because we must build this thing. We must make new structure. It must be beautiful. We must fix this new light. We must fix this new bulb. We must fix this new speaker. We must do this new gadget. And in the midst of entrenching structure, erecting structure, implementing structure, now, we now neglect the welfare of the sheep. That is dogma by excellence. And by excellence, I mean in the negative. Look at this in the scripture. The Lord is saying, anything we hold above the scripture, anything we hold beyond the scripture, Anything we hold side by side with the scripture, they say, so I mean, our pastor says, and we quote this and quote that, and we make the quote of Pastor A, General Overseer B, equal as if it's equal to the Bible. That is dogma, and that is contrary to the scripture, contrary to the spirit of God, contrary to the word of the living God. In Acts chapter 15. I read verse 28, Acts 15, verse 28. Before you give so many rules that becomes dogma in the church, you read this. For it seems good to me, to the Holy Ghost, for it seems good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than this necessary thing. And what are the necessary thing that is complete enough as written in the scripture? Look at verse 29. That ye abstain from meat offered unto idol, and from blood, and so, from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if you keep yourself, ye shall do well. Fear ye well. It says here, only the commandment of God must be kept, not the idea of of a denomination, not the restriction of a denomination. And I pray for us, I pray for myself, I pray for you, that our churches that have gone from being a living, lively church to becoming a dogmatic church, God will revive, they will restore these churches again in Jesus' name. Actually, most of the churches started where? They started with the scripture, but when they begin to grow and they begin to entrench some things that are beyond the scripture in the name of structure, and what they set up 
becomes, that is the structure that is set up, becomes equated to the scripture. And that is the danger of dogmatism. And what do you do to these people? You make them slaves of men. You make them feel, except they hear you and obey you and take to all that you say, they must not reason out anything in the scripture. But you know what the Bible says? That the believers of this barrier, the barrier believers, they were more noble than those of Thessalonica. Why? Because they searched the scriptures, they, they searched for themselves. They sought to know if what they have been taught by Paul, if they can question what was taught by Paul. An apostle today, why shouldn't they question you? The greatest apostle in the early church was being questioned. This Berean believer, they go and search to see if those things were so or not. And so, let's not restrict man to the idea of men of God. The Bible is the final authority. It's good that we have structures being set up. It's good that we have things being taught. We should keep to those as much as is in line with the scripture. Why? Because Jesus Christ is our perfect example. The Holy Spirit is our superior authority. And the Bible is the basis by which we do anything in the church of the living God. I pray that your gifts will not be lost. The grace upon our lives will not be misused. And the Lord will do for us what only you him can do for a man in Jesus' name. We want to pray today for the church that God, as we have gone through this series, that God will restore the church of the living God to where we ought to be. That we will not go from this traditional church to become a dogmatic church, eventually becoming like the Pharisees and the Sadducees of those days. That we will not end up like them. You know, in the end, it leads to hypocrisy. And we make, uh, we make disciples of men instead of making true disciples of the Lord. In Jesus' name, we we'll pray. Father, I pray for this church. I'm talking about the global church that God will cause us to return to the Bible, to get back to the basis and take the scripture as a final authority in Jesus' name. Before we crucify that, before we judge that, before we cut that down, before we discipline that, before we say that, get away from there because it disagrees with us. I pray you will help us to know that once the Bible is clear, we remain clear there. And when the Bible is silent, we should remain silent there. And keep to the world and keep to the truth as written in the Bible and not the idea or the dogma of any man. May we keep to the world as you have taught us in the truth. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. I pray again for myself, pray for you, that the church of the living God, we we'll get back to the Bible in Jesus' name. Remember again, dogma, doctrine beyond the Bible. Operation without the Spirit, given outside the New Testament. Movement restricted by the prophet. Authority taken as infallible. Structures above the welfare of the sheep. May the Lord deliver the church of the latter days from the dogmas of men. Amen.